Professor, you're on mute. Professor, we can't hear you. Okay, how about now? Yep. Yes. You're back. All right. So yes. What I was saying was uh, we apply the same principles we learned earlier about the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. So it doesn't really matter what the cost of the increased ICP is, whether it's brain trauma, brain tumor, uh, stroke. The It's the same brain we are taking care of and the same concept of increased ICP uh, in relation to the Monroe Kelly Doctrine. Um, so whenever you get a question on the exam giving you <clears throat> blood pressure and ICP, since you have those two numbers, then automatically calculate the cerebral perfusion pressure because that's all you need. You need your blood pressure in order to calculate your mean arterial pressure, and then you need your ICP in order to calculate your cerebral perfusion pressure because that's really your concern with all of these patients. You want to make sure, is my patient's brain receiving enough blood flow? Any question on that part? No. All right. So there are different types of head injury. <clears throat> we have penetrating and we also have blood force trauma. Uh, regardless, it could be uh, minor. There are three levels of brain injury. We have mild, moderate, and severe. Mild injury is also called co a concussion. So that's where a concussion falls under. <clears throat> we'll look at those next. Um, brain injury, regardless of the level, whether it's mild, moderate, or severe, will have two phases. First is the primary injury. Primary injury, as defined here, is the result of the direct uh, resulted directly from the cause of injury. So, for instance, when remember earlier when I hit uh, Whitney, uh, when, when I hit her as she walked around the corner, uh, remember she hit, I, I caused injury to her frontal lobe as well as the occipital lobe. All right, so that those two injuries are both primary because they resulted directly from the trauma. However, minutes and hours later, there will be secondary injuries that will occur. They are not resulting directly from the primary injury, but rather the, the, the mechanisms that follow. So as defined here, primary injury occurs with the initial mechanical insult, whereas the secondary injury are all other injuries that occur after that. So we have about five or six secondary injuries that may result from the primary injury. So this is about what happened to Ms. <coughs> Parakeet. So she had a blow here. So this would be coup, and then she hit the wall. This is now contra coup injury. So now she has two primary injuries. So these are the technical injuries that she suffered. So there was shearing, laceration, uh, some blood vessels burst open. And then uh, on the other side, also, she had a contusion, uh, swelling. There could be blood clots there or even hematomas, depending on the size of those blood clots. We can have skull fractures. Skull fractures can be closed or open. So remember, if, it get, if it's a closed skull fracture, remember that the Monroe Kelly Doctrine applies. However, once this becomes open, such as, for instance, <clears throat> uh, a motorcyclist, for instance, not wearing a helmet. So after the injury, we may have, because now the skull is open, no helmet, we may have to scrape off pieces of the brain off the asphalt now. 
um, so the, the helmet is a good thing that way you know all even if you have an open head injury you have an open skull injury uh, at least all your brain pieces are inside the helmet so we can bury you whole okay you're not missing pieces of your brain remember that miss Giselle So here are explanations of uh, a star of um, skull fracture and penetrating injuries. Um, the one I'm testing here is the just the definition. So 3911, so I'll give you a description of the injury and then you just identify what is all oh, that's a skull fracture, that's a penetrating injury, that's a concussion, that's a contusion. All right, so that's for table 39.11. So just simple one or two questions on the type of head injury. That's simply a recall. With regards to hematomas, remember that hematomas will be space occupying masses here. If they appear inside the skull, then they will definitely increase intracranial pressure. And it doesn't really matter where the hematoma is. If it's a epidural versus subdural, they are going to occupy space in the brain. Therefore, there will be a they will be space occupying masses increasing ICP. So if you read here, both will increase ICP. It's just a matter of how fast are they going to cause it? Because it also depends on what vessel or vessels were affected. If it's an arterial bleed, then of course the onset of the symptoms will be faster. If it's a venous bleed, <clears throat> then the, the increased ICP will be gradual, uh, which could occur days up to a week later from the from the time of injury. You have signs here of skull fractures. We have the battle sign, we have the raccoon's eyes. You've probably seen them in photos or on TV uh, during the uh, protests when um, the, uh, the police were very, um, I don't know how to describe it. Uh, so you saw injuries, they don't happen right there. They occur hours later. So you see somebody who have been hit with a baton, for instance, or just struck on the head, but then they were hit on the head, but then the, the bruising is around the eyes. So that's an example. Those raccoon eyes are evidence of a skull fracture. The skull fracture obviously is not on the on the uh, on the head so the fracture occurred inside so if you have fractures like that then the bleeding of course will not be directly in the head but will be uh, like around the the blood will settle around the eyes or if it's a basal skull fracture like this one the hematoma or the bruising will be behind the ear <clears throat> so that's what we call the the battle sign but they always occur later they do not appear at the time of the injury. So that's the raccoon's eyes, and then you have the uh, battle sign. Is someone in the lobby? No, Gladys. Can you still see my screen? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 
I froze for a couple seconds. Uh, most subdural hematomas occur in the elderly. Frequent cause is a fall. They may be fine. And uh, I'd like to warn you that these patients may, if you ever end up in a long-term care facility, these uh, patients are veterans in falls. So they know exactly what's going to happen after the fall. So after the fall, they will be observed closely. They'll, they'll be sent to the ER and their experience in the ER isn't always the best. So they'll be made to wait in the, in the, in the room, get wheeled into the CAT scan and then wait again several hours for the CAT scan to be read. It's just natural. You have one or two ER doctors, so it's, it's a very busy room. Um, not everybody will be attended at the same time. So the doctor has to multitask between patients. He can't wait for the, for the CAT scan result without seeing another patient. So you, you know how it goes. So these patients are smart. So they, they remember their experience in the last time. So the next time they fall, what do you think they'll do? Will they tell you the truth? No. No. Mm -hmm. So especially if it's not witness, if it's witness, they have no choice. You know, they can't lie their way out of it. They will be sent to the hospital. If though the, the fall was unwitnessed and then you see them on the floor, they can't get out. So I'll tell you a story. So I walk in, patient was on the floor sitting on a pillow. Then I went in. So he, he already, he has his answer ready. He says, oh, I didn't fall. Okay, I just slipped. I slipped down. So I thought, oh, and then the pillow was conveniently on the floor when you hit it. And he said, no. Actually, what happened was when I got up to dangle, the pillow fell and then I tried to grab it and then I slipped down and then fell onto the pillow. All right. So, so he, well, he had a good story. Um, I, I sent him anyway to the, uh, to the ER, you know, against his, you know, of course, he protested the whole time. But that was actually a good move because uh, once in the ER, we, we saw a subdural hematoma. And, uh, of course, that was uh, dangerous because right at that time, he didn't have any increases, I mean, noticeable increases in ICP because it was a venous bleed. So the hematoma was growing slowly. So, therefore, he had it drained <clears throat> uh, and then everything's fine. Uh, I can't say the same for others because there will be a time and I can also imagine how the nurses would be feeling. Imagine this happening at the start of your shift. Oh, no, not at the start of shift, the, the end of the shift. Yeah, the end. So you're, you've already given report. Oh, no, you, you're about to give report and then go. But then this patient decides, you know, and then your CNA comes in, hey, we have a patient on the floor, and then that will change your plans because it happened technically on your shift. So you have to attend to it. You haven't given report yet, so that's your problem. So when they go in, talk to the patient of course the patient will have the same story you know no I didn't fall and then the, you know they they negotiate are you sure right you didn't fall right you didn't hit your head right no no not at all no just my you know just my bum fell and then later so they keep it hush hush no they didn't report it as a fall because you know the patient said no and then they document that um, you know patient uh, you know, they, they covered their, or so they thought they were covering their ass. So they, they wrote it on the documentation. And then days later, the patient's unconscious. Patients already, uh, the, the subdural hematoma got slowly bigger and bigger. Plus, if you, you know, these patients will have uh, the change of level of consciousness here is lethargy. So you may interpret as, oh, in the next morning, oh, they're tired. Okay, they didn't want to get up early because they're not totally that high in ICP yet. So they'll just say, oh, I'm tired. You know, leave me alone. I want to sleep. So they let him sleep in. And then later, uh, they're already 
um, unresponsive. And that could be two, three days, or even a, a week later, okay, depending really on the size of the, of the bleed. Here's a contusion. Uh, contusions um, are bruising okay, on, the, on the brain itself. So there was blunt, obviously this is blunt. This is not a penetrating trauma. Uh, so this will cause the secondary injuries of uh, edema. Edema is a secondary injury. As well as the, if you think about it, increased intracranial pressure is actually a secondary injury because it didn't technically result directly from the primary injury. We have vascular injuries. <clears throat> um, again, these are uh, related to hemorrhage now, and then the hemorrhage, of course, the longer it sits there, becomes a hematoma. All right, so let's do, well, diagnosis again, just like in the earlier uh, under increasing check the pressure, it's still the CAT scan. And uh, monitoring ICP, of course, is the intraventricular catheter. Craniotomy will be necessary in order to evacuate the blood, the hematoma. Depending on the size, we'll also determine the size of the the surgical opening that will that will be needed. If it's smaller, then they probably could just drill a hole uh, in order to suck it out. But if it's bigger, then of course it'll be a bigger incision. In all of these patients, we use the same monitoring. It will be Glasgow Coma Scale constantly. Of course, if it's a stroke, then we use the NIH Stroke Scale. Um, but for all other injuries. It's the Glasgow Coma Scale. But nursing care will be the same. So you still monitor your number one problem here is increased ICP. One of the secondary injuries is a seizure activity. So as the ICP increases, of course, that will cause irritation, irritability of the brain, and therefore will stimulate a seizure. So one of the medications given to the patients, standard medications on top of mannitol and saline is, what have you seen in clinical? Which drug, which anti-seizure medication is usually given? What have you seen on the MAR? Dilantin? Um, Dilantin is more <laughs> given for a patient Adipan. with epilepsy, with oh. a known seizure oh. disorder. Oh, Ke Kepra. Kepra. Kepra, very good. It's levetiracetam. That's um, more for prophylactic, whereas if a patient has a known seizure disorder, that's when we use um, phenytoin, which is Dilantin. <laughs> And here's the positioning again. So I agree with this one. This one's better. It, uh, this is one now says 30 degrees. Then always um, neck and midline. Another reason for why I disagree with the 90 degrees is what happens to the hip flexion if you have a 90 degree head of the bed elevation? Is that a sharp hip flexion if you go 90 degrees? Yes, it is. Right. So it will increase intrathoracic pressure, decreasing venous, venous drainage or venous return from the head. It, that's really the position. So you either flex the hip or flex the neck, the same thing. It will increase or de it will rather decrease venous return, venous drainage into the head, uh, from the head. Um, although the hip flexion here is um, has two steps, it has to increase intrathoracic pressure first before it will decrease uh, venous return from the head, whereas neck flexion directly prevents venous drainage from the head. 
because we have a skull fracture, possibly skull fracture, any clear fluid coming out of the nose or the ear is suspicious for CSF. So you could have a CSF leak here. Now, we normally send the sample in uh, to the lab um, for, for CSF analysis. You can do that if it's, if it's clear. However, most of the time, it's not only clear drainage. There may be blood present at the same time. So if it's in that case, then we have to do a halo sign. So what we do is grab a piece of gauze or any white, um, white material, any white absorbent material, which is gauze. So you dab the, the, um, the drainage. Uh, this is only if the drainage is not totally clear, if it also contains uh, blood with it. So the best way to do that is to dab it with in a, in a gauze. And if the resulting um, appearance on the gauze is there's a uh, ring, there's a yellow ring around, around the blood, then that means it is CSF. We call that the halo sign. It's, it's reliable actually. Uh, because it takes time before you send a clear drainage. Plus, if it's clear drainage uh, plus bloody, blood plus clear drainage, if you send that to the lab, all they'll do is test it for glucose. Of course, there's glucose in the blood, so it may not always um, identify that it's CSF because all they check for is the presence of glucose, which again, blood has glucose. So the halo sign is more um, reliable. And here, if you can avoid nasogastric tube, of course that will increase ICP plus may also, um, if the fracture is around there in the nasopharyngeal area, you may make it worse. Uh, if needed, then you put it in the mouth instead, instead of the nose. You can have a OG tube. Uh, patients, of course, will not be given anything by mouth, so either a peg tube or, uh, or a gastric tube. Again, we try to avoid a nasogastric uh, tube, uh, if possible at all. Uh, see here the same as we discussed. Avo avoiding nasogastric tube? Yeah, if at all possible, because mm -hmm. again, that will increase ICP, plus, of course, we may... If the fracture is um, involving that area of the head also, that, that may make it worse. So if you need to put in a tube, either it's oral gastric tube or a peg tube. All right, so here's maintaining okay, thank hyperthermia. You. So this is, uh, you already know the effect of hyperthermia. We put them in seizure precautions prophylactically. And here's the drug, levetiracetam which is commonly given. Uh, Phenytoin is written here, but in practice, it's levetiracetam is given. Patients are at risk for DVTs because they're immobile. They are uh, intubated or at least not um, you know, uh, given, if at all, they'll be given bathroom privileges. Maybe that's it. For, that's for mild or moderate um, brain injury. In the case of um, mild brain injury, the, the patients may not be admitted to the hospital. They'll be sent home, but they'll be given instructions on when to bring the patient back to the ER. Um, they did not list that here in this textbook, so I can't. Um, but uh, they are out of the ordinary. Mostly mild brain injury, would the, the patient with a concussion will have headache, they'll have nausea, vomiting, they'll have gait disturbances, they'll have some visual disturbances as well. They'll have a short-term amnesia. They may have a short loss of consciousness, less than 30 minutes. That's all expected in mild brain injury. 
of course, if those change, if they get worse, then the patient has to be uh, taken to the back to the ER. Say, for instance, headache is expected. However, if this headache becomes severe or the nausea becomes severe or persistent, the, the patient with the visual changes now has um, loss of vision instead of just blurred or double vision, that of course those are changes. Um, if because of the headache, they shouldn't be given heavy opioids, they should be given just Tylenol for a headache obvi for obvious reasons. If you give them opioids, the, the effect of the opioid might be interpreted as a, you know, a change in the mental status. So we don't want to cause those changes. Um, that's it for head injury. Any question? This is page what? What would, what would you what should you do to take care of a patient who has EFF fluid coming out of their ears? Oh, um, after identification of the fluid, then you notify the physician. If there is a evidence that it is a CSF leak, they'll take another CAT scan depending on the uh, size of the leak. Um, then they'll decide whether or not they'll leave it alone or surgically repair the, the leak, the, the, um, the fracture. Oh, okay. Thank you. Hey, we still have time. Let's do. Seven, six. Um, you know what? The rest of the time, let's do a uh, Glasgow Coma Scale. Let's do a practice. Uh, wait a minute. I've, have I done this last semester? Can we do a review? No, I don't remember doing it. buried me my internet is so slow Professor, yes. For the for the TBI, you mentioned with the peg tube, is that temporary or is that for life for the patient? Oh no, just because um, we have to feed the patient. Right. So only for a short time. Okay. You know, a peg tube uh, closes right away after you pull it out, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Uh, we've done this last semester, right? No. No. You sure. Positive. We don't see the positive. All right. So I did a little switcheroo here. The official Glasgow Coma Scale starts with I, followed by motor, and then verbal. So that is the highest points are four, six, and five. So to make it easy, I'd rather go four, five, six. So it's easier for me to remember. So if the eye opening is spontaneous, like no need to prompt the patient, um, then that's a perfect score. They open their eyes spontaneously. Please do not interpret this as someone sleeping. So it will be, of course, if you're doing this test, you don't do it on a sleeping patient because that if, if you do that, if you have to wake them up first, then you, you might interpret it as a three. All right, so that's that's not fair. The patient is sleeping, so you don't test the, the do the Glasgow coma scale the moment you go into the room and then they're sleeping and then, oh, there, there are three. There, then your perfect, your score is now 14 instead of 15. All right, so don't do that. The patient has to be informed that you are doing a Glasgow coma scale. So there, of course, if you're already trying to wake them up and they, they can't, or you know they only open uh, their eyes when you actually call or shout at them, then that's a three. If they only open their eyes if you put pain, let's say you pinch their nail bed or you perform a sternal sternal rub, then that's opening to pain only. Or if they don't open their eyes at all, that's a one. So there is no zero here. The perfect score is 15, a dead person is three. So everybody's a winner. For verbal, if they're alert and oriented, that's a perfect five. The slightest confusion will be an automatic one point deduction. It doesn't matter how confused they are, whether they only don't know the date or if they don't know the date or the place where they're at or current events, it doesn't matter. There's confusion, so that's an automatic one-point deduction. If they're saying inappropriate words, let's say it's different from confusion because in, in confusion, at least they are making sentences, right? They're, they're just not aware of reality. In inappropriate words, so let's say if I ask... Um, Miss Ojola, I ask her, um, do you have a boyfriend? And then she says, totally something off. Like, like I like Trump. Okay, <laughs> or let's say, um, I have a dog. Okay, so totally inappropriate. Doesn't, that's not even confused anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. But, She's still saying words, though. She can form words. They're just not appropriate to what's, to what's you know, being asked. So that's not confused anymore. That's totally inappropriate. So that's a three. Now, if they're just making sounds and not words, so let's say they're groaning sounds, or if I ask um, Miss Iggy that, uh, Miss Iggy, can you... Uh, can you shake my hand, please? And then she goes, bum, 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 or she, she, or she just goes, mm, mm. So incomprehensible sounds, then that's a two. And then a, a nonverbal patient will be, of course, a one. The motor response. Now, if you remember in stroke, there was hemiparesis, right? Or hemiplegia. If one side is weak or paralyzed, you still score the best response. So if there's only one side that's that has function, then you score that side, All right? So you don't score the, the, the side that is uh, obviously weak or paralyzed. So if they obey commands, this is motor, so you ask them to do something. Okay, you blink your eyes, please, three times. They're able to do that, then that's a six. If um, they can only localize pain, meaning they can't follow commands, but then when you 
when you put pressure, I would do this by putting the stimulus on the head. That way they're forced to put to use their hand. So if I put pressure on the forehead or above the eyebrows, for instance, and you know something, uh, you, you put an annoying stimulus there and then they'll brush it off, then that's localizing. Flexion withdrawal is normal flexion withdrawal. So again, you put you, you put the stimulus on the functional side and anything you could pinch the nail bed, for instance, or or twist the one finger, for instance. So that's pain. So if the patient's able to take their arm away, that's normal flexion withdrawal, meaning they're using the same arm to to um, to withdraw from the pain stimulus. Abnormal flexion is now the corticate positioning. Let me show you a picture of a decorticate. Maybe it's here. Okay, I don't have a picture from the book. Okay, this one, this patient here, this position wherein the patient has their arm flexed and the wrist also flexed, and you see the plantar flexion. This is called the corticate positioning. So this is the abnormal flexion response. This one on top is called the cerebrate, which is the same. You have um, plantar flexion also, but then there is pronation and extension of the arm. So there's pronation of the wrist and uh, it's extension also. So they're extending their arm instead and then there's pronation of the of the forearm actually, pronation of the forearm and then they're still flexing their wrist. Uh, here in the corticate also, there's an internal uh, rotation as well, but uh, both feet are uh, in uh, plantar flexion. So plantar flexion here, as you also have internal rotation of the uh, of one or both legs. So this is the corticate, this is the cerebrate, abnormal flexion, abnormal, uh, um, abnormal extension. Now, if I put pressure on here, will you normally respond like this? Will you assume this position? If I put a pain stimulus on your right index finger, for instance? No. no, normal thing to do is you no. withdraw that. But if the patient assumes this position instead, then that's the corticate. So this is um, because the score is three. This one is a two. That means the prognosis for these patients is better than uh, the, the cerebrate position. So this indicates that the severity of the brain injury here. So this one is better compared to this. based on the school.
So that is abnormal flexion is a three, then abnormal extension is a two, then no response is a one. Let's begin. Gladys, thank you for volunteering. Miss Suma, here? Yeah, yes. Okay, uh, about this spontaneously looks aloud, that is a five. When you speak to the patient, they tell you who they are. Uh -huh. When they are, they are and the five. And they tell you, so they have uh, five. Uh, can somebody mute their phone uh, mics, please? Um, only Gladys, thank you. Sorry, Gladys, no, proceed. Yeah, so they have a 15. Okay, very good. So this one's at 15. Okay. Next one, Miss Carol. Adult moves their hand when you apply pressure to the nail bed. The patient makes a sound, makes words, but not form sentences. They open their eyes to pain, but not to speech. Four. Is that your total? No. Seven total. Total. Are you too stingy? Is it ten? Okay, this is a 10. Actually, it's a 9. So the I here is how much? What's your score to I? Only to pain. So that's A. 2. Okay, what about your verbal? 3. Okay, this is inappropriate words. 2, 3, so that's 5. And then motor is... This is normal flexion withdrawal at a four. So five plus four, nine. Next, let's have Priscilla. Adult moves hand towards head when you apply pressure above the, the eye socket. They are disoriented but able to form sentences. They open their eyes in response to speech. Um, 12. Okay, very good. <clears throat> it's a 12. Any question on this one? Okay, uh, Susan. Adult opens their eyes when they hear you shouting for help. They groan and make sounds that you cannot recognize as words. They do not respond pain. Um, 
line? Uh, you're too generous. Oh, wait. Um, seven. A little too generous. Six. 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 Okay, this is a six. Six final answer. Six because the I is three. They only make sounds, which is not worse. There's a two. That's groaning. Five. And then no response to pain. One. Six. Um, Tamara. Still here, Tamara? Uh, okay, uh, Mar Margarita? I don't open eyes when you speak to them and it can hold conversation. Girl seems disoriented. Patient flexes elbows and wrists when you put pressure on the nail bed. So, eyes open spontaneously. It's for um, Patient is confused. Is another four. And motor response. Is it three? What's the total? Eleven. Eleven? A little too generous. Ten. <clears throat> okay, this is a 10. Wait, why? Okay, uh, opens eyes to speech, that's three. Three. They're disoriented, that's a four. And then this is abnormal flexion, 10. Okay. All right. Tamara, is she back? No? Yes, I'm back now. Okay. Am I supposed to read it? Yes, you are. Okay, sorry. Adult opens eyes and extends left elbow when you put pressure on left nail bed. No response on the right, makes no sound, and opens eyes in response to nail bed pressure. Um, so that would be eye opening. Would it be? So I open it and I would get a score. No pressure on the right. So five? Right, very good. <clears throat> Whitney. 
with me here, right? Yes, I'm here. The adult flexes their elbow and wrist when you put pressure on the nail bed. They do not open their eyes at all. They make grunting noises, but no words. A six. Very good. All right, so questions on the test. There'll be, I think I had two there. Uh, simply interpreting the um, GCS score. The others are embedded in a uh, different question. All right, next is Jasmine. Adult extends their elbow when you put pressure on the nail bed. They can talk in sentences and are disoriented. They are unable to open their Eyes. Um, well, eyes is one. Disoriented is four. An extension. Six. A little of oh, a tiny bit. Um, Seven. Very good. <clears throat> Seven. Uh, the motor here is two. This, this is abnormal extension. And this one's a four. And then that's a one. Uh, as you can see, these are all hypothetical. Okay, this is not, these are not real patient. Uh, these are impossible. So this is just for uh, practice purposes. All right. <clears throat> Miss Iggy. Adult extends their elbow when you put pressure on the nail bed. They can talk in sentences and are disoriented. They are unable to open their eyes. Um, so that's a one. I have a different thing. Oh. I have a different slide on my screen. Am I oh, frozen? I don't see it yet. Oh, I don't see anything. Okay, now I see it. Adult oh. can obey simple commands and opens their eyes when they hear you speak. So that's a three. They can talk to you in sentences and seem a little confused. So that's a four. Where they are. So three and four, seven and six is 13. All right. Esther. Adults unable to for open eyes ha and has no response to pain. It's three. All right. So this is either deep coma or dead. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I had one more. Yeah, um, Gladys. A dot opens their eyes when you say their name. Uh, that is three. That is a five. Uh, when they apply apply pressure on their nail, they move their hands. That is a four. So they have from nine to twelve. Twelve. It's a twelve. How much your total? Twelve. Um, what's your score for the eye? They open their eyes. So I have uh, three. Okay. Uh, they speak. Verbal. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'll speak to you in the word that makes sense. So they're oriented. 
verse 5. No, it says he speaks to you in words that make no sense. Oh, no They're sense. words, though. Words, but no. they don't make no sense. That is a dream. Okay. So, it's 16. What's your total now? 10. 10. Very good. <clears throat> All right. Um, that's it for today. We'll continue next week. And uh, Thank you. Thank you. Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor. Bye. Have a nice weekend. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. Sierra. Thank Have you, Professor. Thank you. Bye. All right. So I'll send the recording uh, shortly. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye, Professor. Goodbye. Bye, Thank Gia. You. Um, Professor, did you mark me for attendance? What happened? I was asking if you marked me for attendance. Sorry, I had issues with my internet. Oh, yeah, yeah, I got you. Thank you. All right, have a good day.